Friday afternoon at 2.30, and you're probably getting a little tired. So I have something here, hopefully that'll maybe wake you up a little bit. Me roll from right, I'm 
All right, I'm, I'm hoping everybody's awake now. Um, again, welcome. I want to thank Dominic and Lisa for inviting me here today um, <clears throat> to speak to you. Um, so just a little background. Um, I joined the Navy at 17, worked on aircraft. Um, by the time I was 18, that's me in the picture launching Phantoms off the USS Forrestal. And that was one of the best jobs I ever had. Um, it's four years in the Navy, and then I spent 22 years in GA. I received my airframe power plant certificate. I'm not a pilot, I'm a maintainer. And then uh, while I was working in GA, uh, I was in the Rhode Island Air National Guard, and I spent 34 years in that unit. And 20 of those years, 20, 34 years, well, I was a full time technician. And I retired from the guard there um, a few years ago. I was fortunate enough to retire as a QA chief. Um, it's an interesting job. Um, that picture right there is Bagram, Afghanistan. I've been to the Middle East three times before 9-11, two weeks after 9-11, and then in 06. Uh, I've been all over Europe, Central America, South America, United States. So it was a pretty interesting job uh, as a maintainer. So uh, I guess you might be wondering, you know, what, what, what's this maintainer gonna talk about? I'm not a pilot, um, but this course, this presentation is uh, what I do usually is geared towards maintainers, human factors in aircraft maintenance. Why do maintainers do what they do? Why do they not follow instructions? How they can be better, how they can be more efficient and be safer. So that's what I'm gonna, I, I'd like you to think like a maintainer. I know the majority of you are probably pilots, but um, this is also gonna be helpful for you to learn how to speak to the, speak maintenance, speak to the maintainers, so you can establish a really good communication link. 
So one of the things uh, that we delve into in the maintenance world is DuPont's Dirty Dozen. It was created by Gordon DuPont. He worked for Air Transport Canada, and it was a way that they identified um, factors that affected maintainers' uh, work and the cause of accidents and risk management. So normally in this course, I go through each one of these 12 factors. Obviously today we don't have time for that, um, but I'm just gonna go through two, two items today. So the way we describe this in the maintenance environment is if you have a lack of one of these six items, you probably don't have too good of a um, safety culture, okay? Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, um, I'm not gonna read slides to you. I move along pretty quickly. Um, you can follow along and I'll talk to the slide, but I'm not gonna sit here and read the slide to you, to, you know, bit by bit. But the six items, communication, knowledge, teamwork, resources, of assertive awareness. If a team is missing any of these factors, it could affect their work. It could, uh, they could have a bad safety environment. It could lead to problems. Uh, maintenance uh, problems, accidents, people getting hurt, things like that. And on the other hand, if you have too much complacency, distraction, fatigue, um, again, that could uh, cause an issue. And as I get through the presentation, I'm going to do a couple of case studies and you'll see where these factors come into play. So the two things we're going to talk about today briefly are communication and risk management. Uh, there's your basic definitions of communication uh, and risk management. I'm going to highlight a little bit, go through uh, communication rather quickly. Um, I mean, we could spend hours on it, but we, we're not going to do that here. So there's two main methods of communication, verbal, nonverbal signals, verbal speaking, and the other one obviously is written. So no matter what way we communicate, this communication loop is, is basically the way things work. And I can follow along. Let's see if I can get this pointer to work. All right. So, you know, the sender say, I want to say something to somebody. I want to send them a message. So I think about what I want to say, how I'm going to say it. I transmit it to that person. And there's always filters, right? Filters can be anything from a language barrier, uh, equipment, phone connection not being good. Um, maybe you're not speaking the same kind of lingo. Uh, you know, maybe you, in aviator sheen, we have our own lingo and, you know, the other person might not understand that. So those are all filters to communication. They're going to they're gonna block your message. The person that you're speaking to is going to receive that message and decode it and have his own idea of what you said or what you want to convey to that person. He, in turn, is going to take that idea, take that message, and encode it himself and transmit it back to you. And again, there's those filters that are going to be involved. And that person is going to receive the message back, uh, you as the sender. So that constant loop, that's our communication loop, that constantly goes on as we talk and speak and communicate with people on a daily basis. So this is important because as maintainers, um, we have to constantly be in communication with ops to just know what the problem is. We have to be in communication with each other to work as a team because we very rarely work alone. So there's rules, some pitfalls to this communication. I talked about the filters. If you look at those statistics there, 55% of the way we understand the message is through body language. So what does that tell us? When we're talking on a radio or talking on the phone or writing a message, we're already at a disadvantage. The spoken word is the least reliable, most often misunderstood form of communication. So um, another one of the weaknesses here is word choice and cultural language barriers. I'll tell you a quick story. We had an IG inspection when I was in the guard and I'm from Rhode Island, if you can't tell by the Rhode Island accent. And we were charged to go to an exercise in operation with a unit from Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas and Dias Air Force Base in Texas. 
So we all got together and we started operating and we had to wear gas mask and talk on a radio with a gas mask. And you can imagine what that was like with the guys from Rhode Island trying to talk to the guys from Texas with a gas mask and a mic you know, and a radio. That was, it was terrible. Nobody understood what anybody was saying. They, they, they said that we spoke funny and we were saying that they didn't speak English. So it was, it was pretty comical. We had, it was pretty interesting. Well, I just think we should have wear those safety vests. Oh, come on, man. Those, those vests are for daggone people who really like to use them. Yeah, I don't even see them. They're colorblind, stupid. Golly. Oh. Hey, Tiny, did you get something? Tiny, what'd you get? Tiny. Tiny, oh, my God. 911, what is your emergency, please? Yes, please help us. I think my buddy, I think he's dead. What do I do? Sir, calm down. I can help you. We'll walk through this together. First, I need you to make sure he's dead. Well, I can do that. Hold on a second. He's dead. Now what? All right, what's happening here? Oh, here we go. Okay, so that was kind of funny, but it makes you realize that the choice of words can be have dire consequences. So um, I usually like to show that to folks just to give them an idea of, uh, to think about the words that you choose and how you're gonna say things and what you expect. What you may want to convey to somebody might not be understood the same way to somebody else. So there are some key elements to effective communication. And these are some of the things that we strive to uh, work towards as we speak in the workplace, okay? We wanna speak the same language. We wanna, we wanna be clear and concise. We wanna really get our point across, okay? We wanna ask for clarification. Don't be afraid to ask questions. So getting to written communication, and this is one of the hardest things for a maintainer to do, because maintenance guys just don't like to write. Uh, you know, we want to turn wrenches and fix stuff, and we just have a hard time writing. But I always re re tell the maintainers that it's very important that you write a clear and concise log entry for the work you do, because that's your proof that you did the job. Uh, if there is an issue, if there is a question after, and somebody like me comes, you know, walking in and wants to read that maintenance log, and there's an issue, and it's not an accurate, it's not a complete log entry, well, I'm going to look at that and say, well, you didn't do the work. And you can say all day long that you did it, and you did it to the, the way the maintenance manual said you did, but you didn't write that down. So now you've opened yourself up to question. Okay, so it's one of the big things that I always want to impress on a maintainer is to do a complete and accurate log entry. And as a pilot, uh, uh, whether you're an owner or an operator for an air charter or an airline, a commuter, the regulations. A lot of pilots, a lot of owners that have small GA aircraft think that it's the maintainer's responsibility to get the work done. And that's just not so. So if you look at part 91, 403, 405, 409, there's the requirements for an operator, owner, operator, pilot, to make sure the aircraft is maintained the way it's supposed to be. Part 43 is the maintenance side of it where he has the responsibility or she has the responsibility to do the work in accordance with the manual and to a certain specific characteristic and make sure it's correct. And, re and, and that also outlines who can release the aircraft after the maintenance. So I would stress for you aircraft owners, uh, whether you own the aircraft or, or rent or whatever, uh, talk to your maintainer and make sure that their log, you understand their log entry, you understand what they wrote and don't be afraid to ask questions 
as to if something doesn't seem right to you because you're responsible. They might have done the job, but maybe they didn't write it down properly. Okay. Again, we want to use standard terminology. We want everybody to be on the same page. There's no sense using an acronym if you're the only one that knows what it is. Okay. So uh, it's important that we're all on the same page. And sometimes in a big maintenance environment, that's that can be difficult. Uh, when there's you know hundreds of people maybe working in a in a in a in a factory or a big repair station. So, one of the things uh, that I speak to the maintainers about, especially a new maintainer, somebody that's uh, low experience, new to a facility, new to an organization, you know they're afraid to speak up. They think that just because somebody's been there a long time. Um, then, you know, they, they're, they're afraid to speak up. They're afraid that somebody's going to chastise them. Well, you know, these are some of, the, some of the tips that I tell them that this is when you should be speaking up. When safety is involved, you know there's a deviation to the rules of the procedures, okay? It's okay to stand up and, and ask the questions. So part of our communication loop that I spoke about is listening, okay? It takes two people to communicate. It takes two people to make that loop complete. So the listener has just as much responsibility to listen and hear the message as the person who's sending the message has a responsibility to get that message conveyed properly across to who he wants it to be sent to. So one of the things that you, it's really important, think about this. A listener can listen 300 to 800 words a minute, or a speaker is only at 125 words a minute. So what do you think that, that tends to lead to, okay? If anybody knows the Charlie Brown teacher, where you tune people out, it does lead to a tendency where you finish the sentence before paying attention. You think you know what the person's going to say before they've even finished the the talk, uh, the talk that's the topic and you miss the the important point of what that person is trying to say so it's important that you pay attention slow down and listen so these are actual discrepancies that were um to be honest with you i don't even know where i got them but i know they're actual discrepancies and the way they were signed off okay so the first one the tire almost needs replacing, and um, so they almost replaced the tire. Something was loose in the cockpit, and we tightened something in the cockpit. There's dead bugs on the windshield. Well, the live bugs are on back order. We have to wait for those. So there's a leak on the gear, so we removed the evidence and the DME volume unbelievably loud, so we set it to a more believable level. And the aircraft handles funny. Well, we want it to straighten up and fly right and be serious. The pilot reports that there was a mouse in the cockpit, so we put a cat in there. And uh, this write-up, there was some noise coming from under the cockpit, so we took the hammer away from the monkey. The test flight was okay. Auto land was really rough. Well, there was no auto land installed on the aircraft. Again, situational awareness. Did the pilot even not know that? You know, that there was that system was not installed. IFF and op, well, it, it was off. So and there was the last one. So I spoke a little bit about speaking aviation, speaking the same um same language. So just think about some of these acronyms. MLG, excuse me, is main landing gear. NLG, nose landing gear. RPM, revolutions per minute. MAG is magneto. MAP, manifold pressure, absolute. HYD is hydraulic. These are standard uh, abbreviations that we use in maintenance. CHT, cylinder head temperature. Left hand, right hand, center, and ground. 
So um, think about this. How would you write up uh, a squawk for an excessive mag drop on the right mag of an engine? You might put something like right hand mag, excessive RPM drop greater than 100 RPM. So now the maintainer knows which mag it is. He knows there's an excessive drop and he knows how much of an excessive drop. All the information that he needs to troubleshoot the problem is there. So this one, the aircraft was pulled, pulled to the left when you apply the brakes. So again, the maintainer knows what's going on, what side is it pulling to, and he, he can troubleshoot the problem a lot quicker and a lot easier. And the last one, if you notice a banging sound, taxing the aircraft, well, it seems to be coming from the nose landing gear. You write that information in there, be accurate, be complete and, and uh, legible, and it's gonna help the maintainer be able to fix the problem. So a quick review of communication. It's a two-way path. One person's not an effective communicator, but two or more people can communicate effectively. Important that you uh, stay in touch with people and work together to have a good communication system. Oh, that was fun. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about risk management. Um, that previous video, I'm sure that those people didn't have really good risk management skills. So part of risk making is, is uh, excuse me, risk, making, risk management is the decision making process. So we're constantly making decisions uh, constantly thinking about what's going on around us, how we can do things better, how are we going to stay safe, how are we going to manage the risks that are inherently involved in flying in anything. So this is basically the decision-making process that we use on a daily basis every day. Um, we collect an inf information, we make sure we have enough information and accurate information to make an intelligent decision. Uh, we filter out what we don't want and what is important. Then we determine a course of action. How are we going to proceed? What are we going to do to manage this risk? What are we going to do to continue on to get the flight in or get the class in or whatever we're going to do? And then we, we initiate and we act on it and we complete 
our action based on the decision that we made. And it's a continual ongoing process because sometimes things change and we have to adjust. So uh, part of this decision-making process is situational awareness and being educated, being knowing what we're doing and, and um, moving forward and constantly thinking about how we can be safe. So, of course, like anything else, this is people make a lot of errors with the decision-making skills. Some of it is just poor risk management, like the folks in that video. A lot of times people are really overconfident. I've done this before, uh, I've done it a million times, they get complacent, uh, especially in the maintenance world. I don't need to look at the manual. I've done this a million times, but they don't know that maybe that since the last time they did it, there's been a revision to the manual and something's changed and they don't know it. Now they got a problem, they have a problem. They damaged something or they hurt themselves or somebody else, okay? These are some of the more common types of things that where people run into problems. Um, Over-reliance on most recent experience. You know, sometimes people do things and it might not be the way they're supposed to. It might not be in accordance with the regulation. It might not be in accordance with the manual. And they get away with it. They have a shortcuts. Maintainers, sometimes they're always looking for shortcuts. They might get away with it and they get away with it and they get away with it. And now it becomes a norm. And they forget the fact that they're even doing a shortcut. That's just the way they do the job. And then all of a sudden, something happens. There's an accident, there's an incident, somebody gets hurt, something gets damaged. And they step back and go, gee, why did that happen? I've been doing it a million times and I never had this problem. Well, that's why, because you've been doing it wrong all that time and you gain more confidence every time you do it wrong and you don't have a problem, you gain more confidence thinking that you're doing it right. But what I like to tell the maintainers, this is a rule of thumb. If it's dumb, dangerous, or different, you need to stop and think about what you're doing. So like anything else in aviation, we train, right? Pilots are always flying. They want to train. They want to get proficient. They want to get good. Uh, maintainers are the same way. We train. We go to classes. We read. Um, you know, we actually, uh, in a lot of organizations, you have OJT where you have to do the task a few times before you're able to be signed off on it and, and do it on your own. So um, some, of the, some of the things that affect our decision making is, is uh, when we get too complacent. It's, it's difficult to avoid the complacency. And that's what a lot of people get, how a lot of people get into trouble. Um, the last statement there, everyone owns a knock it off. What I did down at Quonset in the Rhode Island Air Guide when I became the QA chief, I instituted a knock it off program where everyone uh, in the maintenance facility and maintenance, the personnel had a little card that we carried around with our ID and it was a knock it off card. And if there was something going on that you weren't comfortable with, or if there was something that was, we were doing a task and it wasn't the way we initially briefed to do that task, Everybody had the authority and the responsibility to flash that knock it off card and stop the task and to see what was going, what was going on. Why are we not doing this? Um, there was no retaliatory issues. Um, you know, people didn't use it to stop work just because they didn't feel like working and thing. It was a, it was a safety culture that we instituted um, that worked really well. So, in, as far as flying goes and operations, um, I can tell you that in the last, last this past year, and I believe even a little bit more than that, the last three accidents that I investigated all had to do with fuel mismanagement. Perfectly good aircraft, uh, perfectly capable pilots, uh, no mechanical defects, no health defects, no um, any factors that um, cause the pilot to not be able to perform his duties. Just uh, not paying attention, uh, not assessing the risk, thinking that, oh, I don't need gas, I can get to this point, um, I'll be fine. Not, not looking at all the factors, whether, um, you know, anything like that, where it causes a delay, and now we run out of fuel. So um, these kinds of things happen quite often. 
Um, so I wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, don't, don't let it be you. Make sure you think about things uh, before you take off in your flight planning. Uh, it's important to try to think about all the, you know, the what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, and cover all the bases. This is another incident, um, <clears throat> one of the flight schools that I have uh, surveillance from uh, of. Um, the CFI came back from a flight with a student and he reported that the engine would seem to be running a little rough once in a while, but it cleared up and it was running fine. And uh, he was talking to one of his other CFI buddies and they decided that, well, we're gonna go, let's go take the plane for a flight and see if we can troubleshoot the problem and see if we can see what's wrong with this, you know, cause it's like an intermittent thing. We're gonna go, we're gonna go try and fix it. So they got in the aircraft, taxied right by the maintenance facility, got to the end of the runway, did their run up to take off and check their mags and the engine quit and just stopped. The aircraft had to be towed back to maintenance and this, this is what, what the result was. So I don't know if you're familiar, but this is from a Lycoming, I think it's a 320 four cylinder engine, that's the crankshaft. That is a hefty piece of metal, okay? Let me tell you, it's not, it's not a, delicate piece of metal. It's a hefty piece of steel. And uh, it was determined that a crack was induced into the forging process and it was there and it just failed. And um, so think about that. Uh, what kind of decision making did those two CFIs have or utilize, not utilize, if that thing failed a minute or two, la minute or two later, where would they have been? They would have been at a couple of hundred feet, probably over the end of the runway, climbing out with nowhere to go, no power. Okay, so um, the the reason why I bring these things up is is think about what you're going to do. Think about your decisions. You think it was a good idea to go troubleshoot a rough running engine in flight? Probably not, right? So what causes mishaps? <clears throat> there's risks, there's uh, hazards in every operation that we're in, whether on the op side, the maintenance side, uh, they're there, okay? There's always a culture in an organization, there's influences from outside influences, inside influences. Uh, you know, maybe the company doesn't have enough money to operate, so they're cutting costs. Maybe they don't have enough people, so people are overworked and they're tired, they're fatigued, which is a big deal in aviation, okay? So there's latent failures that these things go on, they go on, and nothing happens. So people ignore them. They don't think about them because there's no immediate result, okay? So those things are there, okay? We don't, the organization might not have any way, no safety nets, no way to defend against these fit, uh, latent failures, okay? They're just out there. Unsafe supervision is a big one, especially in the military. You got a lot of young guys that are working and you know the supervision might not be there. The supervision might encourage people to cut corners, uh, not follow all the tasks, um, you know, just do it, get the job done, hurry up, get the job done type thing. Uh, like I said, every task, every organization has this, this problems, this issues, they're there all the time. So what happens is if you, your organization does not have safety nets, if it doesn't have procedures in place to catch these failures and to trap them and to break that chain, what happens is eventually they're all going to line up and now you have a problem. And I can tell you from investigating accidents, there's never ever one specific reason for a crash or an accident or a mishap. There's always something that leads up to it. There's always a chain of events. And if you have these safety nets in place, if you have these procedures in place, and you have a, a preconceived safety culture that's constantly thinking about safety and doing things the right way, you can prevent a lot of these accidents. So um, 
this is um i know some of you might be familiar it was pretty um it was pretty well in the news a few years ago an accident out in vegas this is the mishap helicopter sundance air tour it's a eurocopter so the chain of events uh december 7th 2011 they're 135, they were doing a sightseeing tour from Vegas out towards um, Hoover Dam. There was a pilot for PAX on board and um, the helicopter crashed. Uh, everybody was killed post-impact fire. So the green line indicates the normal flight path that they would use on this tour. The yellow line and the red uh, circle is the accident site. And um, flight uh, uh, conditions the flight line turn to the left and then a rapid descent. The pilot called any kind of emergency or anything like that. Never said he had an issue. So the NTSB determined that the probable course was. Uh, was inadequate maintenance. This is a strictly a maintenance um, event. But it does have a little bit of ops in it. I'm going to show you. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, self-locking fiber castellated nuts are used ex exclusively on helicopters. They're used on some aircraft, but mostly on helicopters. You can't reuse them. Um, Improper use of a split pin, that's the carter pin. I don't know why they call it a split pin, it's a carter pin. And in, inadequate post maintenance inspection. Okay. The uh, one of the servo control, the rod end, um, became disconnected and made the helicopter uncontrollable. Contributing factors uh, they feel as though the carter pin was either not installed or installed improperly and the mechanic was fatigued. Uh, also, uh, 135 uh, maintenance uh, requirements, you know, they, they should have a step-by-step -step guide on to doing a task, and they did not have that. It was kind of general and broad. They just had a checklist, okay? And um, also the inspector, the ma maintainer and an inspector. Uh, part of the backstory is that the two gentlemen that were involved in this mishap worked nights. Um, there was uh, a party with the company and uh, they did not work that night shift. They, were, they worked the night shift and they were asked to come in the next day to work a day shift to do the 100 hour inspection on this helicopter. They did the inspection, they came in, they were sleep deprived, they had worked, and you know till like midnight and then they were up at like seven or eight and they worked a long day they were all out of their circadian rhythm they were they were just a mess because they're not used to working days they were in that night shift mode okay and part of the other problem with this uh facility was that there was no human factors training for the personnel so there was no i no way for them to identify to themselves hey i'm really tired maybe i shouldn't be working um and and you know things like that so Unfortunately, it's not a requirement to have human factors training for maintainers. I think they should have it, but um, it's not mandatory. Um, I have been going around and speaking to quite a few for the 10 years that I've been in the FAA, I've been going around to commuter airlines and repair stations and 135 operators and providing this kind of more intense training for the maintainers because I, I feel it's the important. So that's the that's your crash site. Here's the tail. Not much else left. This is the conne uh, connecting rod and the rod end for the servo that was missing. Is another shot of it. Now you see that witness hole. That is so the pilot can do it when it's pre-flight. He can check to make sure that the castellated fiber, castellated nut, and the carter pin is installed. According to the report, the, the mechanic connected it. They changed the servo and during the maintenance. That's why it was disconnected. He connected it, put the carter pin in, the inspector inspected it. 
the pilot came out to do the test flight after the maintenance, he inspected it. It did go for the test flight. It was fine, no problem. The next flight was the mishap flight and it, uh, they determined that the bolt came out and, and caused the accident. So how did three people miss that? That's the question. So if you look at this picture, this is from the accident. If you notice the holes, this is the telltale sign for the investigators. Here's the, the part of the servo where the bolt will go through and here's the rod end for the control rod. You'll notice that there's no deformation, there's no tears, there's no broken pieces. That tells them that the bolt just came out. It didn't, didn't fail or it didn't um, come out post the accident. So the conclusions, the mechanic, the inspector, and the pilot each had an opportunity to look at that connection, but none of them noticed that it was either not in properly or not there at all. And because they reused the lock nut, um, it, it, didn't, it wasn't able to stay on. So it probably just backed off without the cardipin securing it. See what I told you about accidents, there's always more than one way that an accident happens. It's not just a single thing. So at the time they weren't following the requirements. Um, and the NTSB determined that the fatigue of the maintainers was a big contributing factor with this accident because they were off their shift. They were in earlier than they normally are. They were sleep deprived, they were fatigued. And if you've done any reading about fatigue and its effects on the human body, um, it's, it's like being intoxicated. So I always tell the maintainers, would you come to work drunk? You know, would you, would you want to do like a hundred hour inspection or rebuild an engine if you were drunk? And they all said, no, of course not. So why would you do it if you were fatigued? Okay. It's the same thing. Um, the work cards, that was the, one of the last items. They did not have procedures to, um, like a checklist to for each task. They just had a generalized checklist that they use. So, you know, compare it to a pilot, the op side. I mean, you guys use a checklist for everything you do, right? So that's why it's important to use a checklist. It's there to remind you, to help you alleviate your think process. So you can just use the checklist, go down the checklist, and you ensure that you don't miss anything. It's super important to use your checklist. And they also determined that maintenance personnel should have human factors training, which I agree. So that's about it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned something. And if anybody has any questions, I'm here. And does anybody from the group have questions for Dave? You can either use the chat section uh, listed on Ring Central to type in your questions, or you can unmute yourself and ask here. Yeah, I got a, I got a couple questions. Um, uh, this is Savage from uh, UMA. Also, a maintainer um, in the Air Force right now with the uh, in the main National Guard. So a lot of that uh, info was very pertinent to to what right. I do. Um, so that was, that was awesome. I was actually wondering if uh, it'd be if you'd be able to email me those slides. Um, uh, I'm doing a little write up uh, about these presentations that I'm watching today. Yep. And that'd be uh, really great for me to go back through and I can kind of document the cases a little bit better. Okay, um, sure. You can send me your email. Um, the only thing I can't email to you is that video in the beginning because it's fine. too big. <laughs> um, what do you do in the main guard? Uh, I'm uh, a uh, jet mechanic on the uh, KC 135s. You're in the engine shop? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, I was in the engine shop too in the C 130s. That's good. Cool. Yeah, no, I have a few friends uh, when I went going through tech school who were on 130s that I yeah. still contact with today. So, are you guys getting the new tankers? Uh, not in Maine yet. Um, there's been a few bases that are are switching over, but um, I think we still are going to have our 135s for another 10 years or so. Oh my like God, that. they're so old. <laughs> oh yeah, yo, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, if you can, uh, my email is David dot. Cardulo. Okay. David. Cardulo. 
Yeah. At FAA.gov. At FAA.gov. All right. Sweet. I'll uh, go ahead and shoot you an email and um, obviously no rush. Just whenever you yeah, get it. I'll get that to you. Yeah. How long right. have you been in the guard? Uh, I'll be going. So I'm four, four and a half years now. Okay. Stick with it. The retirement's great. Trust me. Right. Yeah. No, um, um, I'm uh, in the, obviously the aviation program here at UMA. Yeah. So I'll probably Good. sort of flying there at some point. So. Good. Good. Good for you. Good luck. Thanks so much. What other questions do uh, folks have for David? I have a question, David. So as we mentioned when we were talking, you know, a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. I was married to an A&P mechanic mm -hmm. and, you know, there was always the fight, for lack of a better word, between pilots and maintenance, right? Oh, they didn't do this. They yeah. didn't. And then on the flip side, oh, maintenance didn't do this. Maintenance didn't right. do this. And it was always a struggle to really live in harmony. Mm -hmm. And I guess if it's really a question more so than a comment you know how do you maintain risk right there's an equal right. playing field three people were able to inspect that Sundance helicopter and three people missed that right right so everybody assumes that risk everybody mm -hmm. needs to share in that responsibility right. and I guess for our flight students especially as our flight students who are going to be younger not have the experience fortunately mm -hmm. Our, our group is proceeding through their ratings, but you know, they might be intimidated to reach out to maintenance or ask the question. And I guess, how do we teach them to, you know, you got to kind of be that ass, part of my, you know, part of my language without being an ass. Right, you know? right, right. You have the right to, to sort of not question them, but say, you know, how do you, how do you help me understand what you, we squawked this yesterday, mm -hmm. it, you fixed it, help me understand that process or what yep. do I need to know? There's a lot right. in that statement, but sure. you know what? I'm I know what you mean, because I can tell you, being a maintainer my whole life, I've never done anything else but be an aircraft maintainer. You've dealt with all kinds of ops folks. You have the ones that are willing to learn, they want to ask questions, and they want to treat you as an equal. And then you have the other ones, the other spectrum where I'm a pilot, I'm better than you, I know more than you, you're a dumb mechanic, you don't know anything. And I'm going to tell you, Titan, is, is be respectful, okay? Keep, be, be, treat people the way you want to be treated, you know? Um, treat people on an equal playing field. Because maintainers go through a lot of training. Uh, maintainers continue to train, and they want to learn their craft. And the majority of the ones that I've met are craftsmen and they're, they're concerned about safety, and they, and they take their job serious. And, and I can also tell you that if you want to ask a maintainer a question about how something works or what this is and what that is, they're going to show you because they just, we just love to explain things to people. So I, I would, that's the biggest thing is just be respectful, be professional. And, and, and it's, don't be afraid to ask a question because it's all on how you ask the question. You know, if you come across as I'm Joe the pilot, I'm better than you, you're probably not going to get very far. <laughs> I think that's some more advice for yeah, anything absolutely. Like, really. To, but absolutely. To, yeah, it's, it can be a very sticky and contentious yeah, situation. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, so I'm in a... Uh, uh, the professional pilot program uh, at North Shore Community College, uh, north of Boston. Yeah. Um, and I want to become a commercial pilot, and I, I'm not sure where I want to go, but I've worked as a car mechanic um, mm -hmm. years ago, and I love working on cars. Right. And I see the similar, like I own a 73 Volkswagen camper, dual okay. carburetor, air oh, cooled, yeah. and I love That's working right. on it. Yep. And I see the similarities uh, with some of these pipers and mm -hmm. like how it's carburetor, air cooled. Yep. Yep. So I, I kind of want to get into that field. Do you recommend me going into a program similar to like going to the college or should I try to land like an apprenticeship working hands on immediately through a shop or. Okay. Well, it, it depends on your time frame. Uh, there's two schools in the area there. One is in Concord National Aviation Academy. 
and the other one is down in Plymouth at Cape Cod Community College. I think they're 14 month programs um, where they're an approved AMT school where you go through the school and then your L will take your test and get your certificate. That's, the, that's one way to do it. If you wanna do it based on your experience, I don't know if you haven't been in the military, have you been in the military? No, and I'm old, I'm 37, so. It's yeah, kind of... so to, to get your uh, permission, get your authorization to take the written test, um, you're gonna need 30 months of experience and it has to be documented for each certificate or for both certificates. 19 months for one certificate, your airframe or power plant. If you wanna do both, it's 30 months. So that's, that's a long time. Um, and going through the school um, is gonna help you uh, be able to pass the test unless you have a lot of experience, you know, a good background. Um, it sounds like you have a background and you won't have any problem in the school, but um, 30 months to get experience. Now you gotta find somebody to work with for 30 months too. You know, and then we have uh, maintenance has a logbook, just like a pilot has a logbook where he records his hours. We have a logbook where we can record all the work that we do. So um, you have to bring that to somebody like me and we sign the form. And then just, just so you know, uh, for a maintainer, you have to take a written test for your general, your airframe and your PowerPoint. Once you pass those three written tests, now you have to sit with an examiner and there's four examiners in the area and you're going to do a practical uh, and an oral exam for each discipline, in general airframe power plant. So it's a total of nine tests that you have to take to be certificated for your airframe power plant. Um, the oral is just what it is. It's an oral. He's going to ask you questions. You have no reference. You have to just know the answer. You talk to the, talk to the examiner. He's going to ask you different things, and you have to know the answer, the practical, is just what it is. He might have the time of Magneto. He might have you look up an AD. Uh, he might have you do a rivet patch or something. You have to physically do something. So um, once you pass all those nine tests, then you can you know get certificated. And what were the names of the two schools you said? The first one is National Aviation Academy. They're in Concord, Mass, right off of Route 2. And then the other one is at um, Plymouth Airport, Cape Cod Community College. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Dave, I would think, you know, just with like the pilot and air traffic controller shortage, there's, there's an AMP, there's a, there's an aircraft mechanic shortage. I have often said like Kyle and to other young people, and you're, you are a young person still, um, you know, if you have, you know, if you're interested in, you know, auto mechanic or that's where you're, looking to go, I often say, have you thought about being an aviation mechanic or, mm -hmm. you know, work in avionics? And yeah. um, it's just, the opportunities are just amazing. Sure. Really the, amazing. the FAA just came out with, um, oh, I'm trying to think. So they just came out with some kind of like scholarship fund for AMP technicians, because there is a projected shortage for AMTs. Um, and the other thing that I always, um, that I have oversight of the two schools that I mentioned. So I always go and talk to the new students and I tell them, once you get that certificate, you will always have a job. You might not like the job. It might not be the best job, but you'll always have the ability to find a job somewhere once you have that certificate. A&P mechanics are always in demand. Um, the, the best thing is to, is to learn I, the other thing I always tell the maintainers is don't think that when you're done with A&P school that you're done learning. I'm 63 years old and I still go, um, and I it's still school. Um, so it's a constant learning process. That's the best way. Yeah, there was a, a comment here in the chat that uh, from Drew saying, Fortunately, the AMP at one B nine, which is Marshfield. Yeah, Marshfield. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I still have a mutual respect for each other as well as effective communication. And yeah. that's that's important. And and like like I said, it's like any kind of relationship you have with anybody. If you go into a relationship and thinking that you're better than everybody and you're not going to learn anything, and it's not going to go well. Um, most maintainers want to 
uh, when given the chance, will, can explain anything that you need to know. It's your aircraft, you should know. Yeah, and, and then like you said too, ask for that help, you know, and I don't know anything about a carburetor. Teach me about the carburetor yeah. and what does this yeah. system do or how does that system yeah. integrate? And, yeah. Uh, and yes, and we do tell our, our you know, those young people that are looking to be professional pilots, if, if you don't want to have lifelong learning, you're in the wrong business. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with, you know, a and you, const you constantly have to uh, develop your craft and your skill. That's, that's a good way to, to move around, to move up and, and advance your career too. You know, nobody wants to be stagnant, even in the maintenance world. Mm. I can tell you when I, when I started working down at the guard, turning wrenches in the engine shop, I never thought in a million years that 20 years later, I would be the QA chief in charge of all, all of maintenance. Mm -hmm. You know, I never would have thought that. So it can be done if you apply yourself. I, um, you, you know, you talked a little bit about human factors and how you're out sort of beating the drum on that. Mm -hmm. and. I find that interesting you mentioned too about like 135 operators not having that human factor standard and I'm a little surprised by that. It's not um, required by the FAA. You know, 91 might be a little slow to follow, but yeah. it's only with, you know, 121, 135, you'd think that a little bit more uh, a repair station, a Part 145 in the United States that has a YASA certificate, where they do work for YASA certificated aircraft state countries, um, they're required to do human factors training once a year. But a standard, a straight US 145 repair station that does not work on foreign aircraft is not required to have human factors. I offer to go and do it for free, and I've done quite a few of them. I've gone to um, commuter airlines, I've gone to MIT, I've gone to some repair state, other repair 135s, and um, so it, I, I'll do it any time I can. Yeah, I, I think that's time well spent, really. Um, and you're right, you know, the pilots get all the glory, um, for the good and the bad, you know, yeah, but yeah. And, and maintenance is certainly worthy of all of that. Yeah. Having lived that, truly. Well, it's the other thing, too, is you, you have to earn that respect, you know. Um, if you're a good mechanic and you take uh, pride in your craft and you you learn and you know the systems, then you, you know you're you're gonna you're gonna get that respect. But if you just want to do shoddy work, not follow the regulations, not really know what you're doing, gonna respect you. Shouldn't respect you. So, but along the way, you make yep. good intentions yeah. to start that. Like, wow, this is. Yep. Just mm -hmm. not feeling it. And that's that's okay. You know, there's plenty of opportunity in aviation. Sure. Um, yeah, there is. Dominic, unfortunately, is on a call um, with another presenter. So I'll just sort of wrap up. If anybody else has any other questions, let me just check the chat real quick. Um, I think Dominic had another question about something else. But um, Dave, we just want to thank you. Right, Jolda. I got a question. Got, I have a comment, actually. Thanks, yeah. Greg. No, go right ahead. Well, hey, so um, I found myself instructing in a SR-22 turbo to a pilot who just bought the plane who knows nothing about what he has. Yeah, that's, and, that's great. There's an accident waiting to happen. Exactly, exactly. So I have at my left hand, Mike Bush's engines book, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't even know what, I'm, what I don't know about right. that, right? right? And about what can happen with the turbos. Mm -hmm. And it is so important uh, I flew 130s and you know we in the Air Force and yeah. after the mission we we sat we had to go to the maintenance hangar and right. debrief mm -hmm. what happened yeah. right? Yeah. Debrief, right we had to do that so yeah. so I get that I understand that I don't know anything about this plane mm -hmm. and it is oh my god th there's so much that has to happen and yeah. I, I realized that I realized at that point and especially now that the maintenance and the pilots have to be a team that's right same level, disregard disregard the rank, but we mm -hmm. all have to be on the same. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where it is. That's that's yeah. my comment. And yeah. I, I'm sorry I tuned in late because I had other things to do. But this is tremendous. Thanks, thanks yeah. so much. You're welcome. I can tell you that um, you know, Navy fighter pilots are yeah. bred to be better than anybody. 
And they, they, unfortunately, a lot of them had that attitude. This was, you know, years ago, it was back in the 70s. I don't know how it is now. But I can tell you that the, the ops folks that I dealt with in the guard were completely different. Um, they would come to maintenance and we would sit a lot of times, like you said, and debrief and figure out what we can do. You know, is this okay? Can we fly the airplane? What are we gonna do? And uh, we had a pretty good relationship, I thought. I mean, I, I, I got along pretty well with all those uh, ops folks. Makes your life a lot easier. <laughs> oh, it sure does. <laughs> Um, well, Dave, like I said, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Yep. And um, we will be, because I know that I think the student had dropped off from UVA, but um, we will be posting up the videos, um, okay. you know, within a week's time. So we'll blast that out. So if people, you know, will have an, a chance to, to jump on, not the awesome video at the beginning of all <laughs> your content. Some of the you just oh, yeah. you like you are good on. of course yeah. you know some of those you know there's of course loss of life and so some of those you just go oh geez yeah. you know good lord but very yeah, interesting. It's a great way to wake start me up. The um, when i went to mrm training or human factors training in the air force that's what they used i stole a lot of that from the air force but um i thank you for having me um i wish every all the students well and good luck with your career and um, email is the best way to reach me, david.cardulo at fa.gov. If anybody has any kind of maintenance question, um, again, I'm not an operator, I'm not a pilot, uh, don't profess to be, uh, but I, I can help with any maintenance issues. And you know, even the op side, I can probably put you in touch with an ops inspector if need be. So thank you and, and I hope everybody has a good weekend. Great, thank you so much, appreciate you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Cool. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.